This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Well, welcome everyone and thank you for coming. I think I should start off by saying that we're living in an amazing times. Our Cubs just won the World Series. <laughs> And we have a brand new president-elect. And you all have come to listen to me talk about herpes. I'll let you choose which is the most amazing of the three. But with that, let me thank particularly Ken Ford for this wonderful invitation. And for Nancy and Ken for graciously welcoming me to Pensac beautiful Pensacola last night. We had a wonderful dinner. It's my first time here, and I've been thoroughly loving it. And if you, don't, if you will allow me, I imagine most of you are not virologists and don't think about virology on a daily basis, as do I. So I'm going to give you my very short version of Virology 101 in preparation for what I'm going to tell you uh, about our research. And let me start you off with a filter. For me, this is where it all begins. Some of you may have heard of the name Pasteur, but you may not have heard of Chamberlain. He was the inventor of a porcelain filter. It was unglazed, and porcelain is porous, and you can actually produce it so the pores have different sizes. And by doing this, they revolutionized sanitation because, and this is what, the, what they look like. These are small versions here. These are some of the original ones. These have a channel right down the middle of the cylinder, and you can put them into this canister and when it's fitted, you can put water through that at high pressure. The water will then start seeping in from the outside of that filter, that porcelain, enter the central channel and come out the bottom of the canister. You now have bacteria-free water. If you have access to this in 1884, you don't have to worry about cholera or many other diseases. It was high tech at the time, and you can see it won the gold medal at the health exhibition at 1884. Now, it also inadvertently led to a discovery that revolutionized biology. And that started in Russia by this individual named Dmitry Ivanovsky. And what he had found is he was studying a plant called tobacco. Tobacco crops were suffering because they would get this mottled or mosaic disease on their leaves. It's not good for production. And what he had discovered is you could isolate the sap from an infected plant and then put it onto a healthy plant, and that plant would then become diseased. And this was the first step to demonstrating an infectious pathogen for that plant. But the revolution was that he took those Chamberlain pasture filters from eight years ago, and he took the sap and he filtered it through there and took the filtrate that exited the bottom and put it onto the plant. All pathogens should now be gone, and yet the plant became diseased and mosaic. And so, as he described it, he had discovered what he called a filterable agent, something that passed through this filter. The first phrase that was used to describe what we ultimately call viruses. Friedrich Loeffler did the same experiment several years later. He didn't actually put a cow into the filter, he just took the <laughs> serum. It's a little misleading, I apologize for that. But he took serum from an infected cow, a cow that was suffering from uh, hoof and mouth disease passage it through the filter, and sure enough, the receiving cow got sick. And there's a quote that I would just like to read to you because I think it really puts a lot of context into what was going on at the time and how phenomenal this was. If, for other, for, if further experiments carried out by the commission confirm that the filtrate effects are, as it indeed appears to be the case, in fact caused by minute living things, then one could very well assume that they are causative agents of numerous other infectious disease of man and animals. <laughs> Emphasis on man. And yes, the unspeakable experiment was then done. These are soldiers from the Spanish-American War, 1901. This is a reason why you do not want to be part of the enlisted, <laughs> especially back then. They were suffering from a terrible disease called yellow fever. And so the experiment was done, and they were offered 100 gold piece for partaking, saying that if you don't partake, you'll probably get the, virus, the infection anyway. So you might as well take it. And yes, it worked. It was a success. People died. 
And back then, that kind of a success was rewarded by having a very prominent hospital named after you. Walter Reed Hospital. Now, please don't, make, don't take this that I'm disparaging Walter Reed, except to say, I mean, certainly accomplished much more than just this one instance. But it does give you some perspective on how our society works once upon a time compared to now. And yet, although they knew that there were these filterable agents that could come out of those, uh, out of those filters, no one could actually see what they were. And in fact, way back in 1683, Antony van Leeuwenhoek had image microbes for the first time in water using his homemade microscope, a single lens that he ground himself by hand. And you may, some of you may have noticed that just last month, Google had a doodle on their homepage celebrating his 384th birthday. But no, one's, no one was able to see these agents. Now let me shift for you, and we'll come back to that, and give you one last piece of perspective. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. Franklin Delano Roosevelt founded this. Does anyone know why? You all know why. <laughs> Very good. You know, my young students have no idea. But that's absolutely right. He had polio, and he also was concerned about the spread of polio through the nation. And so he started this, saying that if everybody can contribute a dime to the cause, we can find a cure to this terrible disease. And notice the poster highlighting that both boys and girls are equally affected, and however, it strikes at random. The twin girls, only one of them has the crutches. That led to an incredible influx that opened the doors to modern virology. In 1949, Enders and his colleagues were able to produce cultures of mammalian cells in a, plas in a glass dish, in a petri dish in the laboratory, and keep them alive. These, are particular, these cells that you're seeing here are in my lab. These are from a monkey, but you can use human cells. I'm sure some of you have heard the stories of Henrietta Lacks, and those are human cells. They would look just like this in the microscope. But the important thing here was he was not only able to culture these cells, but then culture poliovirus in these cells. And by doing so, this ultimately led to the development of the Salk vaccine. That's a Nobel winning prize right there. Nowadays, you just take it for granted. And I just want to point out, as long as we're here, that for those of you who have not looked down a microscope before, that what you're actually seeing is there's a number of cells and the cytoplasm, I have indicated, is, is the outside of the cell. It's the major volume of that cell. It's where all new proteins are made by the cell. And the nucleus has the genetic information. And if you want to see viruses, not only will that allow you to produce a lot of them to look at, but now you can take this wonderful new instrument called the electron microscope, and you can produce incredible images and see those filtral agents for the first time. And no one ever was able to see them because they are amazingly small. This is from a colleague of mine in Germany, Dr. Thomas Mettenleiter, and this is the virus we're going to talk about. This is a herpes virus seen by transmission electron microscopy. And what that simply means is this, sphere, this spherical viral particle has been sliced straight down the middle, and you're seeing what it looks like. It's like a layered onion. So the center of that, that dense core, is DNA. It's the, we'll call that the viral genome. And the circle that goes around that is actually a polyhedron it's a 20-sided object, so we call that an icosahedron. Well, mathematicians call it an icosahedron. And if anyone had children or gan grandchildren who played role-playing games, they would call that a 20-sided die. Okay? And so right around that shell that holds the DNA is a layer of protein. Now, I should say the shell itself is called a capsid. It's very rigid. But the protein that surrounds it is much more floppy. And then around that, defining the whole thing, is a lipid bilayer, so an oily lipid around it. And that has a lot of proteins that span through that layer and ultimately will make contact with cells. And so, just to summarize, we have four different layers, starting with the genome in the center of the particle. Now, I like to refer to this as a nanomachine, and there's a number of reasons for that, but let me just give you one illustration. So when a virus, like a herpes virus, first comes in contact with a cell, whether it be in a dish in the laboratory or in the human body, it will first make contact, and then it goes into a search mode looking for a very specific protein that will lead to a triggering event. Now, these particles don't ha are not metabolic, but they are filled with potential energy. You can imagine them as a Rube Goldberg machine. They're 
put into a configuration that's ready to, to, tr to trigger if the right event occurs. And when the trigger occurs, something happens. The first thing that happens here, when it binds to its receptor, triggers its membrane to fuse with the membrane of the cell. And that leads to the deposition of the internal components of the viral particle into the cytoplasm of the cell, including the capsid shell, the, the polyhedron, and the surrounding softer tegument protein. That then is able to very effectively travel inside the cell to the nucleus, where it docks at openings called nuclear pores and injects its genome into that cell. Upon this event, the cell is infected productively, and if it's in your body, you now have herpes for life. Now, any of these steps can go wrong, right? Something may trigger incorrectly at the wrong moment, the particle may be defective, and if that, but if everything goes right, delivery of genetic information will cause more viral particles to be made in the nucleus of that cell, and that amplification will lead to lot, a burst of, of viruses that can now go out and infect more cells and spread the infection. If it doesn't go right, the virus doesn't really care too much because they've got the numbers on their side. Thousands of viruses per droplet in this mist. Right. Now, I have to apologize, because I know some time before this night's over, somebody will sneeze. <laughs> Don't feel bad. I promise you we will all survive. Okay, so that's the basic idea of how the viruses are working at the cellular level, but now let's talk about us and disease. So when you first come exposed to a virus like this, these neuroinvasive viruses, and I'll define that term in a moment, the first thing that will happen is you'll get the virus replicating at the body surface. This often will lead to some kind of sore or lesion, typically for, the, for herpes simplex virus, type 1, around the mouth. This is a typical presentation. I know it looks terrible, but it's not at all, actually. This is a childhood presentation called gingival stomatitis, and most it leads just a number of fever blisters all around the mouth. And this will take care of itself. You don't need any treatment, really. It will, it will go away. Of course, the infection never goes away. But the person will now seem perfectly healthy, but later in their lives, perhaps weeks later or decades later, they'll get a recurrent infection. And often presents a little bit more subtly. This is the typical cold sore, or herpes labialis. I'm sure many of you have seen this kind of presentation in somebody before. It's fairly common. It's not terrible. People don't go to the hospital for it. But it is a social stigma, of course. And this is a presentation of what's actually going on. So, Imagine the curved blue lines represent how much infectious material is on your lip. And it's going up. The orange down below is when that individual actually is presenting disease, that you could look at them and say, oh, they've got something. I can see sores around their mouth. They're contagious before that happens. This is the success story for the virus. Later, it will recur, and you'll get the cold sore presentation. But notice the third one. The third one I've plotted out here is actually the most common that people will start shedding viruses on their lips and nobody, even themselves, will know. 80% of you, on average, in this room, are infected by herpes simplex virus. Most of you don't even know it. And yet, even those of you can say, well, I've never had a cold sore, that asymptomatic shedding is very likely you. And that's why the virus is in all of you, for that, because it's so successful at doing that. And that's why I'm standing up here. <laughs> Okay, so to understand how that recurrent disease is working, now we've got to define that term, neuroinvasion. When the virus first comes up to a person, it's replicated in peripheral cells, it amplifies, like we've discussed, and then it gets exposed to nerve endings in that tissue, and it's eloquently able to enter those ner ner nerve endings and transport long distance within the shaft of the nerve to the neuronal cell of the peripheral nervous system. In this case, this would be a sensory neuron. When I tap my lip and I can feel my lip, it's those neurons that are communicating that information to my brain. And that's where the herpes virus is going. And once it gets there and deposits the DNA, it goes into a hallmark type of uh, infection called latency. Only herpes viruses truly do this, where they completely shut down and go dormant. And so they're basically hibernating in our nervous system for the rest of our lives. But at some moments, often during emotional stress, think midterm exams, <laughs> it will reactivate. And progeny viral particles will be made in that neuron. And then the amazing thing I think here is that 
they are sent down the axon in the opposite direction that that parental virus came in perhaps years or decades before very efficiently. They'll infect the skin from the underside and you'll have that cold sore presentation. Sometimes they can go to the eye. Herpes simplex keratitis is one of the leading causes of infectious blindness in the developed world. And the worst case scenario, but fortunately quite rare, is the virus can spread to the central nervous system. And when it gets into the brain and amplifies, you now have herpes simplex encephalitis, which is not, has, does not have good prognosis. Chances are the individual will have brain damage if they survive, and survival rates are very low. So that's a very unfortunate thing. And now let me say, for those of you who do have cold sores, don't go running out of here screaming that you're going to die. It's extremely rare. But because 80% of the population has the virus, the numbers game is pretty high. And so this is a very significant problem uh, for healthcare. Now, most of the forms of disease are dependent on the virus to transport in those nerve, nerve fibers. And so this is one of the things that my research program has been focusing on for a number of years. I, I haven't even mentioned what all the viruses are. Besides herpes simplex virus type 1, which is a causative agent of cold sores, there's type 2, which is basically the same virus, but it favors the genitals and the, gang, and the ganglia, that, the sensory neurons that, infect, uh, that project to the, uh, to the genitals. So that's herpes type 2. A lot of people will colloquially say there's the above the belt and the below the belt versions of the virus. <laughs> When I was in Australia for a herpes meeting, the, kids, the students there made shirts saying herpes virus is down under. <laughs> Varicella zoster virus, a lot of people don't appreciate it is herpes, but it, in fact it is. It causes chicken pox and shingles, of course, and it's quite related to these other viruses. So I won't be talking about that further, but I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. I want to mention one other that most of you probably have not heard of. Most herpes viruses actually have co-evolved with their hosts. So the herpes viruses of humans uniquely infect humans in nature. The herpes virus of pigs infect pigs, and horses infect horses. All of us, all of these species, have their own collection of herpes viruses that have evolved with them and are tailored to infect them very effectively. But once in a while, some of them can jump. And particularly if the hosts are closely related to one another. Herpes B, also known as monkey B, infects certain types of monkeys, including rhesus macaques. And when the virus jumps from a rhesus macaque to a human, it almost always causes that fatal encephalitic disease that's so rare normally. But it now becomes the default outcome. And if herpes simplex virus type 1, our cold sore virus, gets into the rhesus macaque, it will do the same thing to the monkey. This brings up a very important concept. Something, if nothing else, I would love for you to take this away. And that is that if there was a selective advantage for these viruses to actually kill us, they would. The fact that monkey B can get into us and drop you means that there's nothing about your immune system that is so amazing that it can defend us against everything. But we don't have to worry about that because these are under evolutionary selective pressure. And if they do kill you, they're basically burning down their own house. And they go with it. So those, any viruses that gain those properties throughout evolution have gone extinct. And what we're left with is something much more benign. But it leaves an interesting, I think, thought process, at least a hypothesis. And that is when we think about what's going to happen, when I'm going to tell you about these infections, you don't have to think about how we're fighting it off all the time so successfully, but rather how the virus is making sure we don't die. <laughs> a little disturbing. <laughs> I was hoping I would leave an impression with you. Okay, so one of the things that I love to do in my lab is tinker. And to tinker with any kind of biology, particularly a virus, it, it means that you're going to start playing with DNA. And so when I was uh, fairly early in my career, one of the first things that we did is come up with a way to genetically manipulate these viruses. And I'll just take you through a very uh, short version of how this is done. You can isolate these particles and, and extract the DNA out of them. And so this would be a circular... Uh, plasmid of DNA. And you can put this through a couple of tricks. We were able to get it to stably be maintained in bacteria. Now, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, what is he doing? And the whole point of this is that for decades, the, science, the life sciences uh, scientific community have been using certain bacteria like E. coli to propagate DNA and manipulate it. And once we had this in E. coli, we could use tools to start changing it. And we could develop some very specific tools so that we could take any kind of change we want, program it that way, isolate the DNA, and then put it into that mammalian cell culture. The DNA itself, if delivered into the nucleus of cells, is, considered, is called infectious. You don't need anything else from the virus, just that DNA to kickstart the process. 
Those initial cells that take up the DNA will start producing viruses that will spread and spread until so you can harvest all that infectious material and study it. One thing that we really like to do is put in what's called a fluorescent protein. So a lot of marine organisms, you may have, some of you may know, fluoresce at night, like some jellyfish. And so you can take those proteins and put them into other organisms, including the virus, and make them fluoresce. So if you shine the right kind of light on them, they will produce a different color light that you can then look at through a microscope. Each one of these dots is an individual fluorescent virus particle that we made. In this case, fluorescing red. Now, I want to emphasize that each one of these dots, you can actually see the pixels from the camera that captured the image is smaller than any given pixel there. These particles are so small, there's no way using light, light microscopy, you could ever resolve them. So they're actually they're sub -microscopic, microscopic. But that's where it would be, and the light is just diffracting out. Kind of like if you look through a telescope at a star far away, you see the diffraction of the star, but you're not actually seeing the surface of the star. You're just seeing a point source diffracting light. Same thing here. Okay. So intracellular transport in the axon nerve fibers, then, is the topic I want to get at now. And of course, the real experiment to do is, if we could, is look at how those viruses are transporting down those nerve fibers. I have yet to get one of my students to volunteer for this experiment. <laughs> but you can do something fairly easy and routine. And then what we like to do is get eggs from a local farm that are fertilized. And you can actually get neurons out of those little tiny chick embryos and grow them in the dish, in the lab. And so that central ball of brightness are all these neuronal cell bodies or sensory neurons, and they regenerate out their nerve fibers called axons radially away from the cell body cluster. And you can then infect that in the dish and image just a little tiny region of those fibers. Traditionally, by electron microscopy, this is something you might see. So this is a zoomed-in version of just one of those axonal nerve fibers. And you might notice towards the bottom what looks like a little hexagon with a dark center. There's a herpes virus particle. It's on its way. It thinks it's going to your trigeminal ganglia from your lip, but it's fooled because it's in a dish. <laughs> the lines that you see in the background are called microtubules, and they're basically like stretched out ropes. Imagine if you're an astronaut, and you didn't have a propulsive jet pack, but there was a rope, and you could grab it hand over hand and pull yourself along while you're floating. That's precisely what happens inside of a cell. There are proteins that act as motors, and they go hand over hand on these ropes, these microtubule ropes, to move. The virus is somehow using those motors that the cell already has to move. Now, when, what you're seeing there is a virus that has entered the cell and fused, like I described for you before. So it's only the capsid shell attached to some of those surrounding soft tegument proteins. That's what's in that image. But here's where the fun begins, at least for us, is that I told you we can put fluorescent proteins onto this. With a fluorescent protein, you don't have to fix these cells and do these bombardment of electrons that are, of course, not compatible with life. You can do a nice imaging with a light microscope at those diffraction spots and watch the process happen. Each one of these spots is an individual herpes virus capsid on the run after it's entered the nerve ending and it's heading towards the, new, the neuronal soma, uh, soma cell body where the nucleus is, ultimately deposits genetic code and takeover. Notice that the motion is very, we call it processive, meaning it's continuous. Sometimes it will, it's, it will pause. It almost regains immediately motion to the right, which is inward bound. Sometimes you'll notice they actually take a couple steps backwards. And so the motion is inherently bidirectional, but the virus favors the inward route, the route that's going to be productive for it. It's a very interesting type of motility, as it turns out. It's not only using cellular proteins to move, but it's cracking a whip, as, as it turns out. Now, you can image the fate of those particles by moving the microscope objective to the center. We like to call this the lab downtown. Here's what downtown looks like. These are neural soma. They're all crowded together. And if you image that, all those dots lining in circles are around the nucleus of those neurons. Here's the overlay. You can imagine that those cells like in the bottom right illustration, our have caps is now docked at these pores of the nucleus, and they're having the viral DNA injected in and being taken over. Now, one other neat thing you can do with fluorescence live cell microscopy 
is you don't just have to image fluorescence of the capsid or one, part, one component of the virus at a time, you can do two. So in this case, we've made a virus that encodes a protein that gives off green light or green fluorescence, and, and the capsid shell itself is red. And so what we're looking at here is a time-lapse staggering image where we image the red capsid, and then we image the green, and then the red back and forth as fast as we can. But while this is happening, the virus is on the run. So it looks like as they're moving that the colors are displacing, but that's a temporal artifact just because it's moving so quickly. The point that I really want to make to you is that this is an example of a protein that stays associated with that capsid as it goes down that axon. And it's a, so you can see in the illustration that I've noted that some proteins in that tegument layer stay capsid associated and some come off and are lost. And this is the kind of experimentation that we did to be able to define that. Why is that important? While the proteins that are bound to the capsid during this whole process could very well be the proteins that make it happen. Think of the capsid itself as a big oil tanker and those little proteins bound to it as the tugboats that are really doing all the work and moving, and moving it around. And so here's something that I think is particularly fun. You can now take that protein and remove it from the virus genetically. And now you have just that protein alone with no other viral material that you can express inside of a cell. And what does that protein do by itself? Well, if you tweak it just right and, and you can reveal its hidden secrets, and hopefully this will play, there we go. This is not an infected cell. But what you hopefully can see here is this single viral protein, which has been made fluorescent, is moving around inside the cell, not just randomly, but almost as if it's on tracks. It's moving on those ropes, hand over hand. And there's so much of it in this cell, you can actually see the ropes themselves being labeled indirectly by all that moving protein of the virus. This protein is an effector of that long distance transport that the virus uses to get into our nervous systems. Here's a prettier example of that using a process called confocal imaging. And now you can actually see the individual spots all moving on these rope-like tracks. Now remember, this is just a single protein that's normally bound to the capsid. The capsid itself isn't even here. I'm gonna come back to this at the end of my lecture. So just remember, we now have that one protein that has this function identified. Okay, but now I wanna get back to really the, I think, the most interesting thing, and that is the disease and how we, deal, how we can deal with it. So, this is, this is a, a question that I've been thinking about all my career, and I certainly don't get credit for it. I was a year old when, when Robert, uh, I'm sorry, Richard Johnson and Cedric Mims said, it must be explained, for example, why a virus causing no more than a cold sore in one person can produce a fatal encephalitis in another. And I do think that's an absolutely fascinating question and something we need to figure out for, to protect people. And recently, a discovery was made in New York. And it's from a laboratory uh, by an individual named Jean-Laurent Casanova, who was originally from France, and he had discovered that we have a protein in our nervous system called toll-like receptor three. Now, the name doesn't really matter. Suffice it to say that what he had discovered is he would, he's a pediatrician and a molecular geneticist. He traveled the world to find cases of adolescent herpes simplex encephalitis and then got skin samples from these people and then did brute force sequencing of all their DNA and try to say, is there something about these poor kids that's different than all of us who, don't, who only get a cold sore and don't get this severe form of disease? And he found this. They are deficient in the genes that encode this one protein. But what does it do? So then a collaboration began that I was thrilled to join. The Casanova lab that I just mentioned was collecting patient tissue, skin cells. They were passing them on to Harvard, who produced what they call induced pluripotent stem cells. Some of you may have heard the stem cells and the controversy behind it. These are not those kinds of cells. These are actually cells not from an embryo, but from skin of an adolescent child. And they're turned into something that's more like a stem cell. So it's pretty nice technology. And that lab of Kettering can then actually differentiate them into a neuron-like cell. But remember, they have all the genetic code of that patient, even though they are now these kind of artificial neurons. They then ship them to us at Northwestern, and we finish the, the process of differentiation and infect them and say, well, what's going on? And here's the cool thing. This is what fluorescent imaging of cells look like at a lower magnification. The first panel, the blue on the left, are the nuclei of those cells in the culture dish. So that's where the, their genetic code is. The next one are those rope-like microtubules. They don't look like individual ropes because we're at low magnification, so they're all bundled together at this low mag. And then this third channel in red is the key one. 
This is a fluorescent virus that we made in the laboratory, and we infected these cells in the dish. And notice at the top, there's no evidence of an infection. There's no fluorescence being made, but at the bottom, there is. And the difference, as you can clearly see on the label on the left, is that the top one was derived from skin cells of a healthy individual like you or me. And the bottom one came from one of these poor kids who got herpes simplex encephalitis and lacked the protein TLR3. And in culture, you can mimic this susceptibility. These neurons have been made to look like brain neurons, the very neurons where the encephalitis would have occurred. The fact that you can mimic that in a dish is really phenomenal. And I was thrilled to be part of this team. I don't get the credit for that, except to say that we just confirmed that result using our, our methods. But it, it, gets, it will get more interesting in a moment. So now, down at the bottom, they've recently been able to make sensory peripheral neurons. These are the neurons that normally get infected in all of us, and where the virus will establish that lifelong infection. And sure enough, the virus loves to infect these cells, and it doesn't matter if it's coming from a healthy individual or the patient, the virus infects these cells beautifully. So what we're seeing is that we can fully replicate the normal neurotropic properties of this virus in a human. Normally, it will go into that trigeminal ganglia, and it does, but it won't go to the brain in a healthy individual, and it doesn't up there either. But if you, take, if you look at the patient, then all bets are off. The virus can infect everything, consistent with the development of encephalitis in a person. So what is this TR3 sensor protein that I was telling you with? Well, I threw a little illustration on there right next to that viral particle on a cell. Let's bring it up. And so it is a surface protein. It spans through the cell membrane and reaches outside of the cell. And it can do a couple of interesting things. But for some reason that we don't understand, it seems to be able to sense there's a herpes virus nearby. And we're still trying to figure out exactly how it senses that. But what it normally would be able to do is send off a cascading signal to this inside the cell, basically saying, get ready, we have a problem, get the battlements up, and in a cell, that cascade that goes to the nucleus leads to the production of a protein called interferon, which literally is, means interfere with viral replication. That's where the name comes from. And so this puts your cells into a nice protective state. The defenses are armed, it's ready to do battle. So, how is it that TR3 is stopping infection of brain neurons in healthy individuals like most of us? Well, let's look, or this, so this is where we had a little fun. So this was work done by a student in my laboratory. And he said, well, let's work this backwards. We know that we're getting a productive infection when we take the cells from a patient who had encephalitis. And that's because I just showed you that fluorescence imaging, where you have lots of new capsids made in the nucleus of cells, and they're all fluorescing. And so the cells turn up and light up. And we can see that. So we know the cells get productively infected. And so now we do some of our genetic shenanigans. And, oh yeah, this is a reminder of that. And so we, we do our genetic shenanigans and we can start getting at these very specific questions. And let me show you how this, this gives you a sense of a couple months in the lab. So the next question is, well, if they can't infect a cell from a healthy individual, can they even get their genes delivered into the nucleus of that cell and get, and get at least to that stage? And so to ask this question, we made a virus that turns the cell's nucleus red if the genetic code gets delivered to that cell. So if the genetic code is gone through the nuclear pore, it will make a new red fluorescent protein, the nucleus will turn red, and you can image that. And sure enough, if you look at the patient cells, they're turning bright red, bright red nuclei, but the healthy ones are staying dim. So that means that in a healthy person, it can't even get its genes to the nucleus. Can it actually go down those neural fibers to get to the nucleus in the first place? For this, we turn back to that kind of imaging I showed you before. Up top is the TR3 deficient patient. They're moving retrogradely down those axons. You can see that nice processive motion. There's lots of, you can't see the axons themselves, but there's lots going through that field of view that they're moving in. The bottom is actually plain. The healthy individual has nerve fibers in that field of view, or the cells have nerve fibers in that field of view, but there no, there's no virus motion. So the virus can't actually even go down the nerve fiber in a healthy individual. And the end result, like I showed you before, getting to the nucleus and docking at the nucleus, you see there's nothing there. The healthy cells, that are cells from the healthy individual, are blocking all of this. So what about that very first step? Well, this, was, this required a little bit of extra work on our part to figure out how to do this. But let me show you, I, th I, th I think you might enjoy this. 
we made a virus that carries an, an enzyme from a bacterium called beta-lactamase. Beta-lactamase is the thing that bacteria use to cleave penicillin so that they don't get killed by the antibiotic. It's their defense against that tactic. An artificial molecule has been made, shown down in the bottom left, called CCF2. The pertinent thing is that it has what's called a beta-lactam ring. So the chemistry, let me detach, let me just point this out, is right here in red. This very constrained bond is high energy. And if beta-lactamase is there, we'll cleave it, and that molecule will split in two. And the nice thing is that molecule is actually fluorescent. So when you shine light on a cell that has CCF2 inside of it, Normally, you'll, get, you'll excite with a certain wavelength of light, and then you'll get a certain wavelength of light back out. But if it cleaves, you get a different wavelength of light because the light energy is not transferring between these two parts of the molecule. And so by doing that, you can ask, is the virus actually getting in? Because <clears throat> the, virus, <coughs> excuse me, the virus is in carrying that protein as part of its tegument that gets deposited in the cell upon fusion. And so here's the basic result. If you take a virus and encodes beta-lactamase and put them into a healthy, the H, or a patient cell, you can see that the fluorescence ratio is changing. And that is indicative that the virus is, in fact, fusing into the patient cell, but not into the healthy cell. And just as controls, if you don't infect the cells, you don't see any background. And if you infect the cells with the virus that doesn't actually encode that bacterial enzyme, you don't see the change either. So it only happens when the virus can get in and it has that foreign enzyme carried along with it to give you that readout. The virus is getting into the patient-derived cells. <clears throat> and so what we conclude is the virus can interact somehow with the cell surface of a brain neuron, and that TLR3 protein senses it and immediately puts up a force field. And it's got to be close to instantaneous because when a virus is coming in, it wants to, it's going to fuse very quickly. And this counter tactic to prevent the fusion is going to be very fast. Nothing like that's ever been described before. And we don't know yet exactly how the cell is able to do that. But it's unique to our central nervous system neurons. Our peripheral nervous system neurons don't do this. So HSV is tuned to infect peripheral sensory neurons, where it goes latent and causes our lifelong infections. But it's also tuned to avoid the neurons of the central nervous system and thereby pre prevent uh, the formation of encephalitis and lethality. It's happy, we're happy. <laughs> but I'm not completely happy. I still would like to stop it altogether. And so I would like to bring you back to this uh, experiment where we took that one protein and put it into cells and saw that it could transport along those ropes, along those microtubule ropes, all by itself. And the reason that was an important experiment for us is now we don't have to be a virologist anymore. We can be much simpler. We can now start studying the mechanics of that protein all by itself, which makes our lives a lot easier. And so from that, we've now been able to start uh, expressing variants of the protein and try to understand basically by dinging on this part of it, dinging on that part, how is it actually achieving this function? Here's one more example of what I've been showing you all along. This is a wild type virus with a red fluorescent polyhedral capsid shell. It's moving down axons in, 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 in a plastic dish, heading to the neural soma where it's going to inject its DNA into the <coughs> nucleus. I like to call this presentation, this, this phenotype, as a marathon runner. These are viruses on a mission. They're moving at about two microns per second. That's probably an arbitrary number. So it means that by the time it's leaving the cells of your lip and going into your nerve, by the, to the time that it gets into those neurons in your trigeminal sensory ganglia, is about 10 hours. And it's running the whole time. That's a pretty good run. As we started digging on those proteins that were associated with the capsid shell that when it enters, we found we could debilitate this. I like to call the motion you see down below the drunk marathon runner. <laughs> You'll notice that the particles are no longer predominantly heading to the right, 
although some quite are, the motion's still there, but now they're bouncing around, they often go the wrong direction, seem to get lost. And the nice thing about this is that this is over a very short distance in a microscope. When you think about the distance from here to about the center of your head where your sensory ganglia are, that's an extraordinarily long distance. That's the 10-hour track that the viruses have to take. And if acting like that, they're never going to make it. So why is that interesting? Let me end with you with what we're recently starting to do. And I'm very excited by this. I hope this is going to work. We're developing what we call the non-invasive herpes viruses vaccine. And so basically using the discoveries that have been made in the laboratory, we're making these viruses that are no longer able to invade any part of our nervous system, not just the central, but they can't even get into the peripheral branches of our nervous system anymore. So these viruses then, when they infect, so, so let me just restate what I've already stated, and I think you all know, but make sure we're on the same page. If a normal virus infects us, it will replicate in that peripheral skin tissue, and then some of them will go down our nerves and get to the cell bodies of the sensory neurons and inject the DNA, and now you are infected for life. What we have discovered is that the invasive machinery that these viruses use is specifically not on the surface of, this, of the viral particle, like many people have been thinking for decades, but on the inside. It's that inner surface that is revealed when the virus enters the cell that contains the specific proteins to achieve this feat. So we like to call these neutered recombinant viruses. They no longer have the neuroinvasive component, but when applied to the surface skin, they replicate there just as well as a normal virus would from nature. They just can't get in the nervous system. So they can't run and they can't hide. And what's nice about that is that if they get stuck out there, that gives our immune system time to kick in. And the mammalian immune system is a beautiful thing if given a chance. And so the immune system will destroy it, it will sterilize it, and it will remember. And what we're learning is that it will now prevent not just disease at the surface, but it prevents subsequent viruses from ever getting into our nervous systems. <laughs> this is not a fun experiment, but I think it's one that is worth sharing nevertheless. There are some viruses, I told you, like monkey B, when it gets into human, is extremely lethal. This is a virus called Pseudorabies virus. It's a virus normally found in pigs, but it will jump to other farm animals. It causes something called the mad itch in cows. It causes something called Pseudorabies in dogs. It'll jump basically to anything and go straight to the brain of that other animal other than the pig and kill it by encephalitis, with the exception of all high, higher primates, which includes almost everybody in my lab. <laughs> so it's a fairly safe but deadly virus to study. And when you give this to a mouse, just gently inoculate it, the mouse will unfortunately succumb to that infection, typically in just over two days. That's that first plot on the left, right over 50 hours. But if you vaccinate with one of our neutered viruses and wait a different amount of days before you challenge with a wild-type isolate of a, of a nasty virus, you can see the animals are starting to survive longer and longer. And by two weeks, not only are they surviving the infection, but they're showing no symptoms. It's like you gave them water. When we have isolated tissue from these animals to say, is there any evidence that despite the lack of disease that the virus is still getting there at all, so far our initial results are no. We cannot detect any evidence of viral material in the nervous system of animals. Now this, of course, is just an initial experiment. It's an artificial experiment done in a rodent. But I think it leads to, hopefully, a useful tool in this battle. I want to end by just saying that there are a number of neuroinvasive viruses in nature, many of which, in fact, humans that we deal with. Rabies, polio, which we mentioned for March of Dimes, are two of the most common ones that people will recognize. Those viruses, despite being nasty and potentially deadly or paralytic, don't usually infect us easily. During the height of the polio outbreak in the 50s, only about one in 200 who got infected actually got poliomyelitis. For the most part, it was an enteric pathogen. You swallow it, it replicates in your intestine, you pass it out. Good sanitation and washing hands does wonders. 
but only one in 200. So it was an aberrancy when that virus went into the nervous system. And in fact, when it did go in, it, was under no, it gained no selective benefit for the process. It didn't spread to other people better. In fact, it spread worse because now it's stuck in the nervous system deep inside of you and it can't get out again very well. Rabies does infect our nervous system very well and then it can spread from person to person or animal to animal. But for it to spread, you typically are being bit by a rabid animal. The vi you could take a bath in rabies viruses and it wouldn't hurt you. It's only because the animal is traumatically damaging your skin and exposing muscle and nerve tissue directly to the virus that that virus can get in and do its horrible damage to your nervous system. These viruses just require a gentle kiss. And I think that's another one of the phenomenal things about these viruses is that they have figured out this way to deliver genetic information to our nervous system. And so despite all the detriment that they cause, it's almost, you can almost imagine a Star Trek future where one day we can actually just paint on something onto a person's lip and treat a genetic disorder from their family that's in their nervous system using technology that nature provides. And with that, I just want to quickly mention the people in my laboratory, particularly Alexia Richards, a postdoc, and Osafami Awalafo, a graduate student, who did a lot of the work. Alexia is working on the vaccine, and Osafami is doing the work on the central nervous system infections. And I'd be amiss not to mention the people who supported financially this research up in the top right, and our wonderful collaborators. Science is a team effort. I could never have done any of this alone. Patricia Solers and Gary Pickard are neuroscientists. Jean-Laurent Casanova, I mentioned, is the pediatrician collecting tissues from around the world. Lauren Studer is turning them into neurons. And Luigi Norangelo is turning them into these adduced pluripotent stem cells that make all this possible. And to my immediate left is Alexia, and to my immediate right is Osafami Wilefo. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. And thank you for listening. Okay. Will your vaccine work uh, with somebody that's already infected? And the second question is, what's your timeline for developing an effective vaccine? <laughs> We're trying to go as fast as we can. <laughs> so the, uh, the first answer is, will it be able to treat somebody who's already been infected? And the answer is, it's not going to cure that individual. Once herpes has its foothold in the nervous system, it's going to take some pretty fancy technology that I can't even imagine yet to get it out of there. The genetic code is now entwined with our genetic code in those neurons, and that's a tough challenge. But by boosting our immune response, we can make, potentially make reactivated events later in that person's life less severe. And I think an important one to consider is a pregnant mother. And so one in 2,000 births in this country, the mother inadvertently exposes the newborn to herpes simplex virus type 2 in the birth canal. And the infections that happen in the neonates can be mild, not that mild, but recoverable to severe. And I would just love the idea of being able at one point to say, first trimester, this person has never had HSV2. And that's important because it's the mothers who get and contract HSV2 during pregnancy that are most at risk of passing it to the newborn. And so if they don't have it, give them the vaccine, perhaps on the lip, let them develop their response. And by the time she's ready for birth, there won't be a problem. That's, that's my dream. I don't know if that's actually going to work, but that might be one way to go about it. Um, timeline, for the uh, timeline for the vaccine. So we have just, so Northwestern is being very supportive about this. They have actually put me into a mentorship program in Chicago where we're working with entrepreneurs and businessmen to try to figure out how to form a company to try to get this to market. But it's in its infancy at the moment. We're just getting started. Thank you. In recent months, the IHMC has been blessed with a number of lectures concerning epigenetics, yes. a new nutrition science that allows certain foods to engage the enzymes and cells, enzymes and uh, the DNA within the cell to allow the cell to intentionally make its own antioxidants at exponential levels. Does, yeah. does that hold potential for the immune system getting greater resistance to viruses? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, this is a real burgeoning field. People have been looking mostly at bacteria thus far. And the idea that our, not only do we have a bacterome 
that is our flora that exists with us, but a virome of all these different viruses that exist, particularly in our intestines, is, I think, going to be a very fascinating piece of research going forward. But at this point, we d I don't know. Yeah. Got one right here. Um, when I was a child, I got these uh, canker sores in my mouth. I mean, all the time, it was just debilitating. Yeah. And uh, my mother took me to the family physician, and he recommended a series of smallpox vaccinations. I took the smallpox vaccinations, and they went away. And, I mean, to this day, maybe I'll get a canker sore once every six months or so. Right. But my daughter had the same thing when she was born, and we probably took her to six different physicians looking for someone that could recommend something. No one could recommend anything, and since there's no more smallpox vaccination, is there anything to help combat uh, canker sores in the mouth? So canker sores can be caused by many different things. And so the problem is, is that it's not always quite clear. Now, I, let, me, let me take a step back and, and just say, I am a PhD researcher and not a clinician. So take this with a grain of salt, please. But uh, I will say that canker sores can be caused by many different things. Herpes viruses, like simplex, is one. And so probably, I'm not even familiar with smallpox being a major cause of this, but one thing that's interesting about smallpox is that when you vaccinate with that agent, it can often cause cross-protection to other agents. And so it might have been an indirect effect that helped you. Uh, as far as your daughter now, I don't know what to say, except that if it is simplex, then all you need is some acyclovir, a drug that is commonly prescribed to treat active uh, lesions with simplex. It doesn't cure the disease by any means, but it lessens the symptoms of the outbreak. And it's a wonderful drug. It's probably one of the best drugs that medicine has ever developed because it has very little to no side effects, even if overdosed accidentally. So you might want to talk to your doctor about a possible prescription there. But unfortunately, I can't say more than that. No. Yeah. Anyone else? I think, okay, that's fine. We'll go right here. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Is there a relationship between stress and the reoccurrence of herpes? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I imagine most people who have ever had a cold sore will be probably nodding in yes right now. Yeah, and so, yeah, with, with uh, kids in college and school, it's right around exams. It doesn't have to be emotional stress. The stress can come in other forms. So, for instance, a sunburn on the face can often reactivate it as well. Uh, certain kinds of chemicals, sometimes found in fruits, uh, when put onto the lips, can also be irritating and be enough to cause a reactivated event. The actual signaling that causes the viruses that are dormant to turn back on again and cause that recurrent cold sore is really still mysterious. There's a lot of people researching it, and we're getting some hints, but there's a big black box there still. All right, next one. Um, what is the relationship between and among the different kinds of herpes, and particularly I'm um, interested in shingles, and whether there is any um, correlation between whether you do or do not get cold sores and whether you will or will not get shingles uh -huh. and should or should not have the shingles virus. As you mean as a vaccine or just have it in general as a vaccine? So I would, again, I'm not a clinician, but I, I can't see why not to get the vaccine at this point. Uh, it seems like it's very effective. It was, it's been used for a long time, started off in Japan, and so I had a long history there before it came to the West. Uh, the shingles vaccine is the same thing as the chickenpox vaccine. It's just a higher dose. One thing to know about those vaccines is, like the one that I'm proposing here, we refer to them as live attenuated. So some vaccines are just dead pieces of pathogen, and they can never do you any harm other than the fact that they're an irritant, and, and that's about it. A live attenuated virus actually can do something while it's in you. The polio vaccine was like that, and it turns out people who get the oral polio vaccine, two drops in the mouth, this is how they're trying to eradicate it from the, wor from the world, uh, they actually will release infectious polio as a result of taking that because the virus will start to regain its virulence while it's in that individual. And so lots of family members can sometimes be exposed to a nasty version of the virus. Chickenpox is much more stable, but it does actually recontain its neuroinvasive properties. So what, I'm what I told you about here today is new. So the chickenpox vaccine and the shingles vaccine, when you get it, it goes right down your nerves and it sets up a lifetime vaccine infection in your sensory nerves. And those things can reactivate. 
And so the only problem there is if at some point you have some kind of unusual condition that would make that vaccine more virulent than it should be. So for instance, if you've become immunocompromised for some reason, your immune system is dysfunctional, that vaccine then could become problematic. In fact, they don't like to give the vaccine to HIV patients because their immune system's compromised and it can lead to complication. So that's the only downside. But right now, based on all the data, a lot of people are getting these vaccines. It's looking really impressive for the typical public. And so I, I would just say, go for it at this point. Oh, and I didn't answer the simplex question, did I? So the simplex question is, as far as I know, there's really no correlation there. Uh, the viruses, although they're related, are quite different in how they infect us, where they infect us. Uh, and I, I've never heard of any clinical study that said by having one, you're more likely to get recurrences of the other. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have had what's now been di diagnosed as molar raised meningitis since about 1973, which causes the whole neural effects. Uh -huh. You basically get the stiff neck, a horrible headache, yeah. your brain swells. I had it recurrently, just constantly, and then they was finally, oh, just about four years ago, we figured out that it was probably molar raised because I wasn't dead. Uh, so it probably was an encephalitis. Right. It, it uh, appeared the first time right after I'd actually had encephalitis, mosquito-borne encephalitis. And um, it, it, they would always occur with lesions that were actually herpes 1 lesions because they were checked out. Um, I still get it. Um, I take valsoclavir when I do, which lessens the intensity of the uh, attacks. I mean, I used to have to do things like take things to prevent um, having um, all kinds of very bad things happen. <laughs> but so it's, it's, it's helping control the neural effects as well. It does control the neural effects, uh -huh. but just wonder, does that mean that the, it's the TLR3 expression that's screwed up with me? Well, probably not, because if it was, you probably would have had the encephalitic infection. That, so that's what that was associated with. Now, here's the thing that's a little tricky, is that there are a lot of rare presentations of disease associated with any type of infection. And you might be one of those unusual in the cases of something that most people will never present. And the difficulty there is you can have someone like Jean-Laurent Katsunoa traveling the world finding these poor encephalitic kids, but finding people like you, enough of them, so we can really say, I mean, everybody's got random mutations in their DNA. That's just, that's just part of being alive. And so being able to say, well, which one of these mutations are actually associated with this type of disease that this person has is difficult unless you have a huge cohort of people that all have the disease and you can say, this is what they all share in common. And so if there's not enough people like you, it's very hard to figure out genetically what's predisposing you to that kind of disease, if it even is genetic for that matter. Are they doing uh, any work on molar raised meningitis? Do you know? You know, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sorry. No. All right, one last question. <coughs> sure, right here. Numerous viruses infect the, the insect kingdom in rather bizarre ways. Uh, the zombie ant, for example. Yes. Are you acquainted with any uh, similar uh, virus infections in humans that don't kill us but change the way we behave? Absolutely. Rabies. Rabies is the classic. I would say it's the prototype in humans. It's, it's a virus. It's got to be from another planet. It is just so crazy. So it's normally in bats, as it turns out, as many of you probably know. But it can get into many mammals from the bats, including dogs and raccoons. Um, and so when the virus gets into animals, it starts off as this piercing bite, either by the bat or a rabid dog. The virus then ascends up the motor neurons that normally cause your muscles to flex. And it slowly works its way up into the brain. And the crazy thing is, it then goes first into a part of the brain called the amygdala. And this is part of the brain that controls emotion. And so when the virus gets there, it makes you violent. It makes animals want to bite. You know, for anyone who happens to be a science fiction fan, this is the zombie apocalypse, right? This is what they almost always say it is in the science fiction stories, that rabies is what got, got, got the world. It's because it's going into the brain, it's changing our behavior, making us act this way, or mostly, not usually humans, but mostly dogs, but humans as well, or other animals. But uh, then the craziest thing of all is that after the amygdala, it travels into the salivary ducts, and it's secreted in the saliva just when it's made you aggressive. And so the rabbit animal is biting and transmitting tons of viruses and injecting it into muscles of other animals. It's, it's, it is almost science fiction. 
On that pleasant note, <laughs> let's thank our speaker.